record. Recording in progress. Yeah. Sometimes we don't recognize that there are things that we are carrying that we don't even un we unintentionally pass on. We are not aware of what it's doing in the passing. We don't see what's happening in the wake, but it is happening. And the wake, our words, our thoughts, our behaviors, they land. They land, they land in the generation behind us. And we don't always know what, how their fabric or their environment or their soil or their soul is going to take it. We oftentimes assume, well, you're from me, so you should be all right. You should suck it up, buttercup, and be able to move on. But the fabric of that same individual is mixed with the fabric of somebody else that may not do well with that mix, right? So the wake is something <laughs> that leaves us damaged sometimes, and we don't intend it. We don't know that that's what it's going to do until we see the fruit. And then we can trace the fruit back to the root and say, ah, yeah, this is this is where this happened. This is where this piece is. And so tonight I wanted to speak. I'm not going to be here long. Tonight I wanted to speak to our the nurturing feminine energy. Since we are spending time around the Women's History Month, I want us to spend time around this particular thought of generational trauma and how the female... I want us to have some conversation around it too. And so for those of you that are watching it live with me while we're on, and those of you that will come back and watch it later, I want you to consider some of the information that I'm gonna be sharing with you tonight through video. It's the very reason why I did not go live on social media because it, they'll probably block this video just because of the information that'll be shared. And if you have some individuals that you can still notify and say, you probably need to get in on this conversation. If you've got time, tap in, listen to this. I want you to hear it. Or we can send out the link after the recording is uploaded. We will probably put it into our YouTube chat, our YouTube channel so that people can access it. But Dr. Joy is coming and she's coming through YouTube. And I want you to experience the reference of this particular sharing. It talks about the posture of individuals, namely African-Americans, because that's who she's talking about in the video. The posture of us being defeated before we even started. And how that idea transfers generationally from one experience over a thousand years ago till the experience of today. And I want you to watch it with me. I want us to have some conversation as it relates to it. This shows the nurturing experience, but it applies to everybody. But I want you to consider it from your female feminine energy point of view. And let's see how it speaks to you. So let me go ahead and pull this up. Um, let's see. Let's get this shared. Yeah, come on, let's get ready for Dr. Joy. And some of you may have seen this before. One of the things that's difficult for post-traumatic slave syndrome is an explanatory theory that really looks at multi-generational trauma. One of the things that's difficult for people is their first response is, oh my God, that happened so long ago. We're talking about people being captured shipped, sold, beaten, raped, experimented on. And then you have to ask the question, did the trauma continue? Yes, so 300 years of trauma, no help, freed. No help, more trauma. If it's a sustained trauma, then the, the impact of that is also sustained. When we look at multi-generational trauma, we're looking at people who are maybe victims of natural disasters and their families and their children and generations of folks who have experienced war. Uh, and we know that there are residual uh, mental, emotional, traumatic impact. And what I did was I started to look at the African-American experience, starting with slavery, as a real clear, long, enduring trauma. So I started to see that there were clear connections between that survival behavior and contemporary living in African-American experience. I started to see common behaviors that I took for granted as, well, cultural. There's adaptive behaviors. Survival behaviors, well, what are they? Let's just say 2019, you have 
a black mother and a white mother. The sons go to school together. They find themselves at a meeting. The black mother leans over to the white mother and says, I just wanted to mention to you that I noticed that your son is really doing quite well. And the white mother's response is, oh, thank you. She begins to go on and on about, he won the science fair, his uncle's an astronaut. She's just oozing. She realizes the black mother's son is actually excelling her son. And she says, well, wait a minute. Your son's the one that's really coming along. And the black mother responds, oh my God, he's a handful, but oh, he just works my nerves. Now, when I'm working with African-American people, it doesn't matter what the audience is. It doesn't matter what class. If I were to ask, is she very proud while she's saying those denigrating things? And everybody laughs and goes, of course, there's a secret. Because everybody black knows that even though the black mother is going, oh my God, she's really proud. So now let's roll that scene back 300 years. And let's say this black mother is working in the fields and a white slave owner comes through and says, wow, that boy is really coming along. What is she gonna say? No, he's not, he's, he's stupid, he's, he's shiftless, he can't work because I don't want you to sell him. So I denigrate them to protect them. That is called appropriate adaptation when living in a hostile environment. The little white boy, say Timmy, you know, he feels really comfortable and happy about what his mom just said about him. And Trey looks at his mom and wonders, why can't you be proud of me? Because he doesn't understand the secret yet. And by the time he learns the secret, he will have already been injured by it. Post-traumatic slave syndrome. PTSD um, is a disorder that occurs as a result of a single trauma. You don't even have to be there to actually get a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. You could just hear about something horrific happening to someone you love. So you have people who have experienced it firsthand, people who have witnessed it in their environment, right? People who are continuing to be oppressed. That exacerbates any possibility of healing. So it's not post-traumatic stress disorder because then it becomes part of uh, what we call your socialization process. So you begin to normalize a way of living and being. Everything from what we eat to what we believe it means to be a friend. You know, all of these things are colored by history. And if you don't understand it, you're gonna fold in things that you've just assumed are normal. But post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, exaggerated startle response, outbursts of anger, uh, feeling of foreshortened future. There was a point where there were you know, African-American children in different urban settings that didn't expect to live to be adults because they saw so much death that they started planning their funerals like at 13, 12, as young as 10. When you start looking at the, the simple biology, you start looking at the, the impact of stress on health. And while we look at general stress, you know, we know finances, you have illnesses, all these different things. How about being black? How does factoring in being black in America impact your stress level and therefore your body's ability to operate its own immune system? Because we know it compromises the immune system. Once you understand it, then you can deal with it. Because you see, it's habitual. You socialize, it becomes a part of your being. So one of the ways you begin to address that multi-generational trauma is to work with the people it directly impacts, to hear from them. And when you give the people the information, they, they can use it. I think the first order of business is beginning to have a conversation. And the other is to educate the larger society. You have to stop the assault. So this is not purely a clinical thing. This requires social justice and change. That's where part of the healing is. It's not in a clinical setting or in a pill. It's in fairness and justice and safety and equity. We gotta work with some of those clinical things, some of those issues of panic and anxiety. And we also have to deal with the fact that you have a system that is set up to oppress you and to continue to injure you. Both those things have to be dealt with. And they cannot singularly by themselves affect a change. They have to be done collectively. To escape from the matrix, you're living in right. Yeah. I thought that she was phenomenal. Tell me what you think about that video as you listen to it. Um, yeah, it's a wow, isn't it? it? It's it's such a wowing experience. When I saw it, I said, there are so many things. Now, this is not Black History Month, but it is something that I wanted to bring to the women to to us because oftentimes we will see 
these particular challenges firsthand. And the way that we see them is in the, the nurturing and the raising of our children. So when you go back and listen to, if you go back to the example that she left or that she gave with the two mothers speaking about their children and how differently that approach was, Tell me what you thought about that. I'll sit here, I'll wait a few seconds. Y'all use your, use your phones, let's chat. Use your fingers, let's chat. Tell me what you thought about watching that scenario. And then think about how you probably have applied that to yourself, unintentionally knowing that that came from a space that probably was imposed on us to assume a particular position. Tell me what you think about that. Yep, I'm listening. I'm waiting for your your chats and your thoughts and your conversations. Very powerful displays. Dr. Joy did a really wonderful job of listing that out, sharing it. Sometimes when we listen to those particular things, right, we'll say to ourselves, well, it didn't hurt me. My mom used to say it to me. Her mom said it to her. And then when you track that all back, all of it came out of a space. That's why I was so amazed by that particular display. I was amazed by it because the track back led to something that we did to protect our children, namely our sons. And it continues to this day because that's how we've learned how to communicate through the environments that we have been built up in and the cycle and the system and the environment that we live in today has not changed a whole lot we've got new techno color <laughs> we've got updated coloring and new technologies but the core of those systems are still living with us right and yet we have moms right who are raising children alone and do you, do you all remember when the, the crack cocaine scenario was really, really strong and it, it our, our men, wow, our African men, my, our African men were either in jail or heavily addicted. I, I know what that kind of addiction is like because my father was heavily addicted um, after experiencing his time in what was it, Vietnam, whatever that last war was before I was born, his experience left him in a trauma guy space and so he turned to drugs and he got to a point where he was off and on, off and on, it was the yo-yo and he couldn't get off. So he was absent from our house, right? And so we were groomed with women who raised their children and we raised them and sometimes we were bitter raising them, we loved them but the condition left us bitter, right? But we loved them and we did the best that we could with what we had in our hands. But some of the verbiage, right? Vicki, I feel you. I can recall those thoughts, right? I can recall those thoughts and I also can recall those statements made to me. <laughs> For instance, my mom, my grandmother used to say, I used to go down to North Carolina and I used to say to her, she used to say, um, um, she used to give me a compliment, I think, and I'd be like, Grandma, I know I look good. And she would immediately say, you know, you got to be careful about um, bringing attention to yourself. You don't want to think more highly than you than you should of yourself. You should always wait for someone else to give you a compliment. Now, that was like 20 some years ago. And I took that statement and I heard what she said. But that statement never landed with me. Not that she didn't have good intentions. That's what she heard. And that's what she knew. But for some reason, there was something in me that knew that I was going to need to learn how to encourage myself if I was going to do the things that I'm doing in the earth. I knew it back then. I didn't know why I knew it. I didn't even know where that knowing came from. But I knew I had to self-compliment. I knew I had to self-encourage. I knew I had to build myself up. Why? Because waiting for other individuals to do it was not going to give me the kind of reward 
that I needed because if I didn't trust my own self or my own voice, I would be looking to other individuals often to be able to affirm me. So I'm so glad while I'm grateful of my grandmother's intentions and I know that her heart was pure for me. Is it possible that that was coming from a space that we did not want attention? Do we sometimes even consider that we're no longer in that former space? <laughs> I'm no longer in a season of survival. And so why do I need to keep using survival statements? Why do I need to pass that on? Dr. Joy did a stellar job with that. She did a stellar job with displaying that the way that she displayed it. Because I think for us as women, the nurturing responsibility comes from us. It doesn't mean, and, and, and tonight I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not here to, you know, blame anybody for anything because there is no blame. We did what we could with what we had, right? But understanding the psychology of why we continue to bring some things to the forefront is important. Why? Because as much as there's been tra generational trauma, there's got to be a generational healing. And I always believe that if there's going to be anything that requires healing, it's going to start from the people that carry wounds. It's going to begin with the feminine energies that are created to nurture. And so how are we nurturing? What are we releasing? How do we release healing through love, through compassion, through mercy, through positivity and stop or remove ourselves, move away from the denigration that would allow someone else, someone that comes from us, someone that we love, that is connected to us to feel less than themselves. In one attempt in that particular video, I understood the slave mother who was saying, nah, they're not doing well. Nah, he, nah, he's dumb. Nah, he's, he's stupid. So that you could put your attention elsewhere. He's not the best of the crop. So in one sense, completely using it for survival, right? But in another sense, the wake of those words landed somewhere. <laughs> and in that condition over 400 years ago, it landed with our men. Probably more so than it landed with our women. And so when we think about how our men are or what our counterparts are like today, they're still coming through the wake of those words that are deeply historical, deeply wounding, deeply challenging, for in one sense it was called to save me, but in another sense, I started to believe it. And now when I'm required to respond as a man, the only way I find my position or my value is, or my power is in my employment or in my penis, right? Because that's the truth. <laughs> we will never automatically, my brothers, we won't always automatically just deal with the penetrating drama that has been called by words that stick us in a space that put us in position where we are like, Ugh. and so here I am, I'm saying this to you, I'm listening, and I'm still listening for your thoughts and your chats. Hey, Aunt Emma, good to see you. Um, I'm listening for your charts, your, your chats and your thoughts. I want to play the video one more time. I want you to see it again. I want you to consider that even as we are responding to a generation that we're trying to help recover and generations that are now dying off that won't ever recover. How do we now help the generation that is present today and the generation behind us and moving forward? How do we help them heal? Number one, awareness. At the moment that you become aware that this has been a thing that has been impeding us, you have the ability to interrupt that pattern. You have the ability to stick your neck in the midst of it and say, no, I will not 
in my own house. Now there are injustices and all kinds of things around us. And so this happens in tier levels. It happens in several different levels. But the primary space that you can allow that to happen in is in your own home environment, mothers and wives. The first, the primary voice, the first voice that your that your child already knew and heard before they broke through the womb was ours. So we're the nurturing capacity. We have the strength, the stamina, and the endurance to be able to, you know, um, to give life, to give nutrients, and to revitalize what might be dead in different people's souls and experience. We are mother in a lot of different scenarios. And so our words before that child comes into the earth, they've been hearing our words that entire time. Oh man, that is such a powerful thing to have a sound, a voice, a recognized, um, the, the ability for a child to recognize the voice that has been speaking to them from the inside, right? Powerful thing, but it's their first influence from an earthly perspective. It's their first influence from another human perspective. So we nurture, we build, we grow. We, we walk through experiences where we may be disappointed with our children, absolutely, yes. I'm not unrealistic because we expect more. We want them to do more. They can be different, they can be better, they can be all of these things, right? But if barring all of those pieces, do we know when their spirits are crushed or do we know when they need to be helped? Do we know when they are hurting or do we know when they can be healed? It's a conversation that I think people need to start having because all the while, while, while we are attempting to rally and to show up with picket signs and all of those things in more public places, we fail at the responsibility of being aware of what is happening in our own environment and in our own homes sometimes. And sometimes because of the busyness of life, if, if your dynamics are that you don't have another spouse that is working, if you're single, you've got to do it all yourself. You've got to work two or three jobs in order to make ends meet. Of course, that's the focus. And so you prioritize what you think is necessary in order to make sure that me and mine survive. <laughs> and that becomes the challenge for because for African Americans particularly, we have been in survival mode probably the longest time. We're probably still in it. Because we don't always know if when we leave the house if we're going to return. We think that things are easier until policing happens. All of these types of things. And that's why I think that the big mama um, the big mama icon was so powerful because there were grandmothers that didn't just grandparent their children. They grandparented the neighborhood. They stood in coalition with other grand grandmothers in order to grandparent the neighborhood. They grandparented the block. They saw all the children, not just their own grandchildren. That nurturing, that that love, that healing allows some people who didn't have family connections to be connected in some form with the community that they could identify as family. This particular healing is, is, is essential. It's important. And so I bring to the table, I bring to the feminine energy, what can we do in our own local environment that would help heal the generation, us, because we're healing ourselves. Yes, sounds like my great grandmother, yes. We're healing ourselves while we're healing the next generation. We're healing ourselves while we're healing our children. And it's not too late. You think that, oh, okay, it's too late. My child is 60, 60 years old now. Well, it's not too late because I am watching some generations and Vicki probably can attest to it for some of the people that she is bringing word to now. I am watching people be healed at so many different levels just because People are giving opportunity, having patience enough for people to vocalize their pain and where their pain stems from. We can still provide generational healing women. We can still provide it. And while, here's this, while we're thinking that we might be um, babying our husbands and, and, and babying our sons, I don't think that our nurture is 
is being looked at in the same way or in the most appropriate way because there has to be safety from the husband and their wife. That's not babying. We just need at the same time our fathers to be affirming so that they balance the nature of that energy. When there are two energies that are required to develop a community and one of those energies is missing, then it will always feel like one side of the um, responsibility is babying the next generation. We, I was listening to Ricky Smiley the other day and he was talking about it. He said, you know, when my, when my grandson is walking around, you know, um, I, I don't let the people, I don't let the the young ladies just be in love with him. He's like three, four years old and he's so cute and cuddly and they just want to touch him. And he says, no, I don't hold this. I don't hold my grandson's hand. I want him to be a man. Like I want people to stop babying my grandson. And Brat was on and she immediately said, but but Ricky, listen, he's a little boy. He's so cuddly. I can imagine that the people, because I do it every time I see him. Every time I see him, I want to hug him. I want to love on him. And I thought in that moment that it was a powerful statement because while we are, Ricky Smiley right now is on the other side of that balance of we got soft men and now we've got to treat them a certain way. There is this, this always, it seems that there's always this imbalance of how we approach things instead of connecting so that we can bring balance collectively. And when we really start to recognize that as our, I, I won't say responsibility because everybody doesn't want to do it, right? And I get it, but I see it as a passion of mine as an African-American woman, as a clinician, as a spiritual leader, as a mother, to a son and three daughters, I see it as a personal responsibility because if I don't now recognize where my own independence has probably um, done well for me in some seasons, but in observation may have presented the an inaccurate view of how I'm supposed to relate to other individuals because I have influence in certain people's worlds. I've got to always make sure that they know there is no me without him. There is no, I don't live this kind of life without my husband. There is a synergy that comes with us. And I understood it when we got married, that there's a synergy that comes with us, that while I was okay by myself, that the synergy that we have together would not have happened without him. So I don't care, you know, there's, there's many things that I did before him, many. But in this season, I don't have to. And I don't want to. And I think that there is this image that God is bringing us to now to remind us that there is a masculine and feminine self that we need to approach in our healing a generation. We have got to consider again that what we may have put out may not have been the most appropriate in those seasons. And now we've got to help heal it. So you heal it from the moment of your awareness. I'm aware that this probably wasn't the best wording for you. I'm aware that this probably wasn't the best behavior to show you. I'm aware that this probably was not, while you're going to see all kinds of things out in the world, and I'll help you prepare for that, that in your safety, you probably shouldn't see it. You probably shouldn't hear it. You probably should not be set up to hear me cussing at you when I know that the rest of the world is going to cuss at you too. That should not be the voice that you hear from me. <laughs> Because I want you to be able to come home and feel nurtured and safe. I want you to also be independent. I want you to be able to stand on your two feet. But I also want you to have the ability to be strengthened in yourself. That's what that video showed me when I saw the two parents that took a different approach with their child. And where that trigger comes from. So I want you to take a few moments before I run this video back again. I want you to take a few moments and just consider it. Consider in your own mind some of the things that you have a hard time that will never leave your mind. It's etched in your it's etched in your mind soul. I'll never forget this. I'll never forget that that was said to me. As a matter of fact, some of us are living out existences now 
of insecurity and low self-esteem because of particular aspects of experiences that we haven't been able to move through and we still have to heal that that was triggered from someone else that was triggered from another time that was triggered from another experience yep we're still being healed but as soon as we know that in us we're transferring the same trauma then we've got to intersect that and say no i won't transfer this trauma that trauma happened to me i'm already recognizing that i'm saying the same thing that my mama said to me and while i know my mom had good intentions for me it didn't land well sometimes we got to be honest about that sometimes we got to be able to say that to ourselves so that we don't give that same thing to our daughters sometimes we have to be able to say that so that we don't give it to our sons generational trauma will live as long as we allow it to perpetuate and facilitate that in the rest of individuals that we relate to connect with birth out of us, relate to as siblings, relate to as parishioners, relate to as church members, whatever that is, whatever social constructs we have, trauma will be there because people don't know how to exercise it. They don't know how to export it. They only know how to be who they are, right? Until there is an awakening moment. And we're like, okay. Man, I can't, I can't say that to you because that's not the truth. I know that that's our lingo, but that might be damaging you. I said, I, I said this to my, my, was talking to my sister today, and we, we, we often parallel how we relate to our girls. And, um, you know, one of the things I know that I came up in, I came up in a vocalized house, and we shared a lot. Marilyn upon a day was the one. She was the one. She, she. Um, we were not individuals that had to be seen and not heard, but we knew, right? But she always gave us the opportunity to be able to say what we, ask questions, say what you need to say, but just how you say it. So she didn't cut us off at the throat. She allowed us to be able to express and then taught us how to do it in a respectful way. So we didn't stop talking. Right, we could always talk. We just had to shape it another way. And I'm really glad that my mom did that. I think it's probably one of the reasons why I vocalize as well as I do now. Because sometimes if you don't learn that as a child, you grow up with having a whole bunch of things that are now stuck in your throat. We have a lot of nonverbal adults who can really talk, but they don't know how to articulate. And so it becomes a concern. And so these are things that are continued because we don't know any better. We don't know any better. But awareness brings us to knowing. Awareness brings us to knowing. Let me let me see, because I'm talking. Let me get the chat up and see your questions. How do you help someone move through that? Um, elaborate more, Mom, when you say, how do you help someone move through that? What particular area? Because this can be so much, and I probably um, move past that. So let me pause. Aunt Emma said, I am healing through therapy, and therapy is good. A lot of times, listen, with that therapy piece, we are, and I'm recognizing it even in my experiences, a lot of times people are just having time, having issues with reconciling the, the questions that their soul has. So imagine if I, I watch an experience, but nobody ever explains it to me. As a child, I watched an experience. I watched my father, um, he he was angry with my mom and he choked and he was choking her and i watched my mother trying to shield us from she kept saying go in the room go in the room now she could barely talk and she's trying to protect us but we were stuck we were frozen me and my brother we were frozen in that state and he he was emoting he was crying and i was just staunch i had no tears i just kind of watched this experience and but I watched the experience, but for a long time, she never explained it. She never explained it. She never really talked about it. We watched different experiences that she had as a mother and she she worked the two and three jobs and she 
kept us in church and she kept us around socialization. I'll honor her forever for all that she sacrificed for us, right? But there were all, and rather, not but, but and, there were also some things that just did not get explained. And so this is my, this was my question back then. As a child, I saw an experience that nobody really ever spoke to me about because they felt like I was probably too young to understand it. But the problem with that was, is that I saw it and I had no explanation for it. <laughs> and so at that moment, right, and I use me as all my examples, at that moment, I was now left to form my own perception about what happened. And that is where the independent girl was growing. She was growing untethered. She was growing without um, influence. She was growing without somebody saying, this is what happened and this is what you should see from that. So she was growing almost like a wild root because I didn't have any explanation. I was just forming my own narrative about that and it created the independent person that I was, but I hit a, hard, a, a, little, I hit a lot of hard rocks. <laughs> in a particular season because I was still looking for those answers. I was looking for my father to answer it. I was looking for my mother to answer it and nobody would or could until I got old enough. It was at that moment of awareness that I started healing some things because that awareness kind of said, mm, he wasn't a bad guy. He had a bad day. Oh, oof. He wasn't a bad guy, he had a bad day. And then the other balance of the story came and I said, ah, oh, I could see that. It doesn't justify this, but I could see that. Then the other balance of the story came and I was like, ah, oh, I could see that. It doesn't justify it, but I could see it. And all of these things come out later, but while I was growing and growing my own narrative, now all of that had to be torn down because it was built out of a sense of me protecting myself, my security, my space. Let me read this. When there's trauma and you recognize it in them, they recognize it and want to walk through it. Fear and possibility of rejection keeps them there. Yes. I think, when there, so when I think about that, if I think I'm understanding you correctly here, they recognize it and they, okay, so when there's trauma and you recognize it in them, okay, so socially, oftentimes, um, one of the things that I think I do well, mom, in, in this particular scenario, and, I, and I've seen it through the course of my life, and now I see it as a clinician, is that sometimes culturally, what I do is I find the thing that keeps us in common as individuals. So I was doing this from a social space, not just professionally. So if somebody was hard to talk to, I would just find what was what we had in common. I, I would listen for what the person liked and then I would just start plugging away at a conversation that would draw them in. That's how I build trust, right? You build trust in the space where that is not digging at information, not trying to get to the end result. You're just building rapport and camaraderie. So when there's trauma there, people are not going to automatically immediately just release their traumatic experiences to you all. There are people today that choose to go to the grave with their trauma and they do. They will never speak about it. Right. So when somebody is having trauma, has trauma and you recognize it in them, try to align with them first. Align at whatever level they are at the moment. Get them in conversations. Spend time connecting with the person. It is that connection that draws people to be able to cross the bridge and be able to share more. Okay? And then as you get that place of safety and that sense of security, then you start to invite them to heal that there are some painful places. Recognition. Um, pointing spotlights in certain areas because now they trust you and you trust them, hopefully the relationship will be mutual. They trust you, they'll start to lay more of their burdens down. And listening does more than responding all day long. Sometimes you've gotta sit in a, in a space and you just listen to a person and when they've exhausted their whole soul, they would be like, oh, I feel better. Even if they don't ever say that they feel better. Allowing someone to vent is the most therapeutic thing that you've ever heard. Even if it sounds like nonsense to you, it is therapeutic for them. So connecting with them, aligning with them, 
um, just walking with someone, being present for someone, even if they give you nothing in return in that moment. That's the investment that you give up front. Right. And so after a while, for the person that you recognize it in with them, they'll start to trust you. You can have deeper conversations around that recognition for the next individual, the person that recognizes it and wants to walk through it. Then they're in a state of change. We, we call the change stages. They're in the contemplation state or the readiness state that allows them to say, I recognize I'm going through something. Um, I and I know it's affecting me. It's affecting other individuals. Get them connected. To um, if they're really at the stage of wanting to get to get the change, and they do, or a fear and possibility of rejection keeps them in it. Um, see if they will connect to a therapist, a clinician, a spiritual leader. If they're not ready to make that turn. There are a lot of videos that I am finding that are being done by regular people that help people to vocalize what it is that they're experiencing. So sometimes when I want to approach someone who I'm recognizing something is in, I'll just send them a TikTok video. TikTok is that really interesting app that allows you to laugh and cry all in the same video. And that double whammy itself um, will you know, cause some individuals say, wait, I was just laughing, but this, this touched me in a particular way. Visualization is a powerful thing. Even play therapy, sometimes even with my adults, I'll take some play time. Come on, let's play cards. Let's play cards and talk. For the African-American male, if you pull out dominoes, they're going to be so open. <laughs> They'll be ready to talk. Finding that space of alignment and making the space light and giving that person time. And sometimes it takes a few days. Sometimes it takes a few weeks. Sometimes it takes months. Sometimes it takes years. But you'll watch those walls come down. And the, depending on the severity of the pain, will, may also determine how long it will take for them to come to this space. So that's a general answer. Um, seeing an individual, knowing them. I think that anybody who knows an individual who's going through that, and you're welcome, you have the advantage of already knowing what stage they're in, right? So even in a clinical environment, we take four to five weeks to continue to build rapport so that we can see a bigger picture, to see the entire thing of what we're dealing with. And so I see somebody once a week, but you might be living with somebody every day. And if you have the ability to be able to separate yourself from that everyday experience, to have insight and eyesight, it'll be a powerful opportunity for you to be able to assist, knowing their personality, to be able to assist, knowing how they learn, visual or vocal, learning how they approach things, and having patience with that process if they're important to you. That investment is important. I believe that our communities are important. I don't want just this for my husband. I want it for our communities. I want it for my other brothers and sisters. I want it for my children. I want my daughters to not have to struggle with connecting with their partners when they come to age because they have been damaged by some things. If I can help it, there are some things I won't be able to help, but I believe that as we know what things are tethered to or tied to, we can say I won't let it perpetuate itself in me. And that becomes the area of awareness that we can stand in. And that's all we would be required to do. So before we go to the White House and stand on the stairs and be chanting, there is a world in your living room <laughs> that may require you to have a different look. And as mothers, as women, as nurturers, we have the ability to not only heal them, but heal ourselves while they're experiencing healing too. Let me show the video again. This will be the last thing that I will share today. And if you haven't had opportunity to see it, you will get to watch it here. Dr. Joy did a great job in sharing it. It is five minutes. I'm going to be in the chat because I want to um, I want to hear what you have to say about them and I'll be chatting with you, but let's share what she is sharing with us. 
this is how, okay, I'm reading your note as well, Aunt Emma. This is how I am learning because I did not know how to say no. I lost myself trying to be all things. Listen, and that's a powerful expression right there. And many people still have that struggle. And they're working through it now today themselves. We're, we're putting the video back up again. It's about a six-minute video. Hang in there. Stay with us. Um, chat in the chat. Let me... Um, point out or highlight some things that you are noticing in the video that you would want to discuss and share and consider. Post-traumatic slave syndrome is an explanatory theory that really looks at multi-generational trauma. One of the things that's difficult for people is their first response is, oh my God, that happened so long ago. We're talking about people being captured, shipped, sold, beaten, raped, experimented on, and then you have to ask the question, did the trauma continue? Yes, so 300 years of trauma, no help, freed. No help, more trauma. If it's a sustained trauma, then the, the impact of that is also sustained. When we look at multi-generational trauma, we're looking at people who are maybe victims of natural disasters, and their families, and their children, and generations of folks who have experienced war. Uh, and we know that there are residual uh, mental, emotional, traumatic impacts. And what I did was I started to look at the African-American experience, starting with slavery, as a real clear, long, enduring trauma. So I started to see that there were clear connections between that survival behavior and contemporary living in African-American experience. I started to see common behaviors that I took for granted as, well, cultural. There's adaptive behaviors, survival behaviors. Well, what are they? Let's just say 2019, you have a black mother and a white mother. The sons go to school together. They find themselves at a meeting. The black mother leans over to the white mother and says, I just wanted to mention to you that I noticed that your son is really doing quite well. And the white mother's response is, oh, thank you. She begins to go on and on about, he won the science fair, his uncle's an astronaut. She's just oozing. She realizes the black mother's son is actually excelling her son. And she says, well, wait a minute. Your son's the one that's really coming along. And the black mother responds, oh my God, he's a handful, but oh, he just works my nerves. Now, when I'm working with African-American people, it doesn't matter what the audience is. It doesn't matter what class. If I were to ask, is she very proud while she's saying those denigrating things? And everybody laughs and goes, of course, there's a secret. Because everybody black knows that even though the black mother is going, oh my God, she's really proud. So now let's roll that scene back 300 years. And let's say this black mother is working in the fields and a white slave owner comes through and says, wow, that boy is really coming along. What is she going to say? No, he's not. He's, he's stupid. He's, he's shiftless. He can't work because I don't want you to sell him. So I denigrate them to protect them. That is called appropriate adaptation when living in a hostile environment. The little white boy, say Timmy, you know, he feels really comfortable and happy about what his mom just said about him. And Trey looks at his mom and wonders, why can't you be proud of me? Because he doesn't understand the secret yet. And by the time he learns the secret, he will have already been injured by it. Post-traumatic slave syndrome. PTSD um, is a disorder that occurs as a result of a single trauma. You don't even have to be there to actually get a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. You could just hear about something horrific happening to someone you love. So you have people who have experienced it firsthand, people who have witnessed it in their environment, right? People who are continuing to be oppressed. That exacerbates any possibility of healing. So it's not post-traumatic stress disorder because then it becomes part of uh, what we call your socialization process. So you begin to normalize a way of living and being. Everything from what we eat to what we believe it means to be a friend. You know, all of these things are colored by history. And if you don't understand it, you're going to fold in things that you've just assumed are normal. But post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, exaggerated startle response, outbursts of anger, uh, feeling a foreshortened future. There was a point where there were you know, African-American children in different urban settings that didn't expect to live to be adults because they saw so much death that they started planning their funerals like at 13, 12, as young as 10. When you start looking at the, the simple biology, you start looking at the, the impact of stress on health. And while we look at general stress, you know, we know finances, you have illnesses, all these different things. How about being black? How does 
factoring in being black in America impact your stress level and therefore your body's ability to operate its own immune system? Because we know it compromises the immune system. Once you understand it, then you can deal with it. Because you see, it's habitual. You socialize, it becomes part of your being. So one of the ways you begin to address that multi-generational trauma is to work with the people it directly impacts, to hear from them. And when you give the people the information, they, they can use it. I think the first order of business is beginning to have a conversation. And the other is to educate the larger society. You have to stop the assault. So this is not purely a clinical thing. This requires social justice and change. That's where part of the healing is. It's not in a clinical setting or in a pill. It's in fairness and justice and safety and equity. We gotta work with some of those clinical things, some of those issues of panic and anxiety. And we also have to deal with the fact that you have a system that is set up to oppress you and to continue to injure you. Both those things have to be dealt with. And they cannot singularly by themselves affect a change. They have to be done collectively. Yes, I'm done today. <laughs> I pray that the sharing blessed you. I do. I hope it did. I'm going to upload this definitely for sure. I'm going to put it on our YouTube channel. I want you to share it with everybody that you know. I want you to share this. I want you to, if you can, if you can get on the phone tonight, text with some people if you, if you have the opportunity. I want you to share with them some of the pieces that you... Yeah, I got it the second time around. Yeah, I want you to share some of these pieces with them that you've heard. Um, and the video will be up. This particular video by Dr. Joy is on YouTube. There is so much about our behaviors today that exist from former times that are not necessary in all of their totality. And we have the ability to change the condition and change the narrative of how our children are coming um, whether they are weakened in themselves or whether they are empowered. Um, we have the ability to help our brothers as much as we don't always like what they do, right? We have an understanding of where that really comes from, which is why there are some people, sometimes we don't even understand why some of our sisters have the kind of patience that they do with some men. But there is something in us when we understand that that be like, yeah, but we still got to nurture our men because we are not good without them being their full self. And that's the approach that we got to take this time around. We, we, I, don't, I don't know. I, I wish I had a, um, a bullhorn. If that's the approach that we have to take this time around. Am I not? I'm not saying that you should accept any kind of crazy behavior. No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just inviting us to consider that there are some other pieces to this that we probably were not open to because we only saw it through tunnel vision. There is a systemic experience and onslaught taking place around our men in particular our African-American men, and we are the nurturing grace that God gave to them. We can heal that just by how we relate to one another, how we love and raise and nurture our children, and how we love and raise and spend time with the people that we live with, we love, we relate to, and we serve. Okay, this thing's gonna make me more emotional than I wanna feel right now, but I got all kinds of goosebumps because I feel very passionate about this space. So share this with someone. They could use it. You probably know a few people that could use this, you know, that would benefit from listening to this. And so I pray that it blesses them too. Thank you for your time tonight. This is live class. We do this every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And next week we may go live. I think we got a guest next week. And so we probably will go back to going on social media, Facebook Live, if it permits. And if not, just feels whatever I feel in the moment, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> but I knew that we couldn't put this live because they would just ban this video. They would ban this whole conversation. And I didn't want that to happen. So 
I'm very grateful for you. Thank you for hanging in there with us. I'm going to upload the video now so those of you can come back to our YouTube channel page and grab the video and send it out. I want people to hear my voice when we talk about this. And women just know our investment in the seed that comes through us, our investment in our children is never wasted. It's not. Our investment in our counterparts after all of the struggle that they have gone through and inherited, it is not wasted. Maybe at this phase of our life, we can provide a level of healing that we may not have even gotten ourselves, but awareness and experience and love and kindness. We can fill ourselves with the information necessary in order to heal them. And as they heal, we heal ourselves. So thank you so much for tonight. Father, thank you for this opportunity to be able to share with the women this, this month and be engaged in this conversation. Thank you for all that is on their heart. Thank you for the provocation that comes as a result of this particular sharing. And my hope is that they will be benefited and blessed because of it. Help us to remember that our nurturing abil ability can heal generations. So as the generational trauma has continued to live, let us in institute generational healing. Thank you for the grace to do this tonight. Amen. You all have a wonderful night and we will see you hopefully next week. We'll be back here um, and have a great rest of your week. Take care.